Okay, so the recording has started. And today what we're going to be looking at uh, is going to be muscles. So let's do the screen share. We'll open up the PowerPoint. Okay, so you should have this PowerPoint that looks like this. Okay, so to review, when we covered tissues and um, we discussed muscles, we said there were three types of muscle, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Uh, for this course, especially for Bio 203 or Anatomy 1, we're going to be focusing on skeletal muscle. When we get into Anatomy 2, we'll focus on number 2 and 3, which is cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle referring to the heart, of course, and smooth muscle refers to the muscles that are around many organs, uh, around uterus, around uh, blood vessels, around the intestines, around the uh, stomach, around arteries, things that you can't consciously control, but that can contract that smooth muscle. I want you to make sure that you go through these links. Um, we don't have to use class time to do this, but these are more uh, interactive links, very short video tutorials that go through this. So just make sure uh, you have um, Wi-Fi connection when you, when you click on those. When you look at skeletal muscle and we compare it and contrast the cardiac and visceral muscle, you'll see that both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are both considered to be striated in appearance but skeletal muscle is the only one of the three that are voluntary. Both cardiac and smooth muscle are considered to be involuntary. Smooth is considered smooth because under the microscope, there are no striations that we see with skeletal and cardiac. So skeletal muscle refers to the skeleton. These are muscles that cross over joints and their function is gonna to be to move bones. Cardiac refers to the heart. The heart is a four chambered pump and composed of a left and right side of the heart. And they contract, which means they create tension to pump blood to all parts of the body. And the reason why we need the heart to pump blood is because blood carries hemoglobin and hemoglobin is what will bind to oxygen. And that oxygen needs to be delivered to all parts of the body to drive it into the mitochondria so that the mitochondria can use that oxygen to provide us with ATP for energy production. The functions of muscles are to produce body movement. When muscles contract, first we have to look at that word contract, right? Most people think contraction means to shorten. That if I move my arm from here to here, that my bicep muscles needed to contract. But well, yes, that's partially true. But it also can contract as my arm is lengthening, not just shortening. So the term contraction really means that there's tension that's being generated within the belly of the muscle. And when that tension is being generated, a muscle can shorten or a muscle can lengthen or a muscle can remain the same length, right? If you're pushing against a wall and the wall isn't moving, you're still generating contraction in your muscles. You can still feel tension being generated. Uh, what else can muscles do? They can stabilize the body, 
right? We need good core strength to stabilize. We need abdominal strength and erector spinae strength, muscles in front of your torso and behind your torso to keep your spine neutral and stable. A lot of the times I will see in my office a lot of herniated discs and a lot of spinal degeneration when muscle tone is poor around the core of the body. We need good core strength to stabilize and balance out the spine. What else do muscles do? They store, they're storing and mobilizing substances within the body. Well, what do muscles store? Muscles can store glucose and they store glucose in the inactive form called glycogen. There's the O-gen ending, the O-G-E-N. So when something ends in O-gen, it means that it's inactive. So when glucose is available in high concentrations, glucose is toxic to the body in high concentrations. So we wanna make sure that we put it in storage. And glucose can be stored in the liver and it could be stored in muscles and it's stored in the form of glycogen. That's the inactive form of sugar. And glycogen can be activated to glucose on demand. Muscles can also generate heat. We know this, we know that um, when it's December, January in the Northeast, if you go outside with shorts and a tank top, when it's 20 degrees out, your shoulders will come up and then your, muscle, your body will shake and you'll generate quite a bit of heat just through the contraction of muscles. So muscles have the ability of generating heat. We know that because if you ever exercise or you run or you're lifting weights, just by having your muscles contract, you get warm. And to offset that heat, you will sweat to cool off your body. We know that if someone has a fever, 102, 103, usually the teeth start to go, you know, like this and then like this. So it's freezing in here, right? And it's really not cold, but they feel cold and their body temperature is tr trying to dip by the shaking and the rapidly shaking of muscles simply to generate heat to help the body temperature go up more. So it gives you this false illusion that you're cold just to make your body contract. As your muscles are shaking with a fever, your body temperature can go up from 103, 104, 105. It can go up to 106 or seven. Brain cells really don't start to degenerate and break down until it's about 107.9, some say 108.3, but the feet, your body is quite resilient. The properties of muscle tissue, muscle is electrically excitable. It has the ability to contract, to extend, and to be elastic. When we talk about different types of contraction, muscles can shorten, muscles can lengthen, or muscles can remain the same length. All muscles attach to bones, and when they attach to bones, they have, they attach to bones by way of tendons. And tendons attach at the proximal part of a muscle and at the distal part of a muscle. They attach to the periosteum of bone, which is the outer layer of bone. And when, the origin of the muscle, which is the more proximal attachment to the bone, and the insertion of the muscle, which is the more distal attachment of the muscle, when the origin and insertion approximate or get closer, we say that's a concentric contraction or a positive contraction or the acceleration. When the O and the I move further apart, meaning the origin and the insertion move further away from one another, then we say it's eccentric. So I'll give you an example. 
you guys learned of a muscle called the SCM, sternocleidomastoid, right? It goes from the sternum, that's the S. It goes to the clavicle right here, which is the C, sternocleido. And then it goes to the mastoid process, which is here. So origin, insertion, almost like right here, like this, origin, insertion. Now, typically, typically the origin is more proximal and the insertion is more distal. Typically, the origin stays still, and typically it's the insertion that is moving. But this is a unique case. This case with the sternocleidomastoid, the origin is here and the insertion is here. When the origin stays still and the insertion moves, watch what happens. My head rotates and moves this way, almost like I'm on the telephone. So the origin and the insertion moved closer together. That's concentric. When I move further away and my head goes back and the origin and insertion are further away from each other, that's the eccentric contraction. You could do the same thing with, let's say the biceps. The origin is here and the insertion is down here. So if I were to take this object and move it this way, the origin and the insertion approximated each other. That's concentric. When I lower this at a slower pace than gravity, the origin and insertion are moving further away from one another. That's the eccentric. Okay. Eccentrics are also considered to be the negative. Some people that use weights or that exercise or train may use a method called eccentrics, which is if someone was doing, let's say a bench press exercise and you take the weight from here and you push the barbell away, that's concentric. That's the origin and the insertion, the pectoralis, which goes from the chest to the biceps, to the bicipital groove, it's now moving closer together. The negative is going slowly, very slow on the way down. That's the negative where the origin and the insertion now move further away from each other. We're back. Did you guys get cut off? You froze. I froze. I it was just you. <laughs> okay, let's start again. Okay, let's see if I can record here again. It definitely shut me down. Okay, looks like we're still recording, which is good. Okay, I'm glad we're back. Okay, so... Let's go back to the screen share. I think the last thing I said was if you were pushing against the wall or pushing against the car, but it's too heavy and it doesn't move and there's no change in the joint angle, that's isometric, meaning same angle. Okay. So when you, you guys are doing muscles now, right? In lab? 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So one of the things that you are required to know for certain muscles are the origins or insertions. So the origins are typically more proximal. The insertions are usually more distal, right? So if I were to give you a muscle like the biceps brachii, well, the origin of that bicep means two, the short head originates here on the coracoid process. The long head goes through the bicipital groove and originates on the supraglenoid tubercle. And then the insertion is down here, just distal to the head of the radius on the radial tubercle. Or yeah, the radial tuberosity, a small little bump right there. Origin stays still, the insertion moves, you get elbow flexion, okay? Origin is usually the part that stays still. It's also the part that's more proximal. The insertion again is usually more distal and it's the part that's moving. In terms of agonist, antagonist and synergist, the agonist is considered the primary mover. It's the main muscle that does the action. The antagonist is doing just the opposite. So if I were to say to you biceps brachii, which flexes the elbow, is the agonist, what's the antagonist? You would have to think what is on the opposite side of the bone that does the opposite thing. So biceps brachii and triceps brachii are antagonists to one another. Synergists, when we're working synergistically, we can say, well, the bicep flexes the elbow, name a synergist, meaning name another muscle that does that. So you could say brachialis, brachioradialis. Those are two other muscles that flex the elbow. If I said uh, wrist flexion and I said palmaris longus flexes the wrist, name a synergistic muscle. You could then say flexor carpi radialis or flexor carpi ulnaris. Those are synergistic. Name an antagonistic muscle. Well, that would have to be a muscle that's on the opposite side of the bone, like extensor carpi radialis, extensor carpi ulnaris. Okay, innervation. In the word innervation, we see in and we see nerve. So all of the muscles up here from the upper extremity, from the deltoids and the rotator cuff muscles and the biceps and all of the arm flexors and wrist flexors and extensors and finger flexors and extensors, every muscle that starts up here at the shoulder goes all the way down into the fingers. They are all innervated by nerves that come out of the neck primarily from C5 to T1. That's C5, C6, C7, C8, C8 nerve root, and the T1 nerve root. All of these muscles are innervated by nerves that come off of the brachial plexus. And again, that is C8, I'm sorry, C5 to T1. C5 nerve root, C6 nerve root, C7 nerve root, C8 nerve root, and the T1 nerve root. Yes, I did say C8. And I know that's odd because there's only seven cervical vertebrae. That's true. But there are eight cervical nerve roots. Then when we talk about muscles of the lower extremity, right, because you're also responsible for muscles like the gluteus, maximus, medius, minimus, iliopsoas, all the quads, all the hamstrings, all the dorsiflexors and plantar flexors of the foot. Now, for the lower extremity, all of those muscles are innervated by either nerves that come from the lumbar plexus, which is from L1 to S4, or nerves that come from the sacral plexus, L4 to S4. So muscles cannot function without nerve supply, which kind of takes us into the segue of what we'll be covering next, which is the neurophysiology of the neuromuscular junction where the nerve and the muscle come together. Okay, so some, uh, some basics here. 
this is the bone. This is the periosteum, which is the layer that covers the bone. Here is a tendon because muscles, what muscles attach to bone by way of tendons. These muscles and the belly of the muscle is what's actually contracting. It's shortening and lengthening. And it is transmitting, it is transmitting that contractile force to this more inelastic tendon that will tug and pull on the bone, right? So muscles don't attach to bones. It's their extension called tendons that attach to bone. If you tear a tendon off of a bone, the muscle is not going to be able to contract and pull it, right? To pull the bone at all. So we have different layers of muscles. If we look at the most microscopic part over here, we have a muscle cell. And this small little muscle cell is surrounded by an endo mysium. And these endomysiums, a bunch of them come together and form what's called a fascicle. And the layer that surrounds each of these fascicles that we see here, each of these fascicles is surrounded by a perimysium. So this would be a perimysium. Around here would be a perimysium. Around here would be a perimysium. When we take a bunch of these groups of fascicles that are surrounded by perimysium, then we take this whole entire structure that's surrounded by epimysium going around the entire outside. Okay. And again, we could see the same thing here. We have an endomysium, then you have a bunch of those surrounded by a peri mysium, which is a fascicle. And then when you have a bunch of these little perimysiums going around, it's surrounded by an epimysium going around the entire structure. And then the tendon will end up attaching to a bone. Same three structures here, endomysium, perimysium, and epimysium, just from a different cross section. That's all that is. And if you need more of a, a verbal uh, description of that, that's what we have here on, these, on this page here, endomysium, perimysium, and epimysium. Okay, we spoke about tendons a little bit. Now, tendons attached to the periosteum of bone, there are some tendons that are referred to as an aponeurosis, which is a broad, flat tendon. There are few muscles in the body that you learn in probably lab that have the term aponeurosis associated with it. One of those areas is the biceps. So the biceps brachii of the arm attaches to the proximal part of the radius in a specific area called the bicipital aponeurosis because it's a broad flat tendon. Another classical one, if you look at it, it's called the latissimus dorsi. Some people say the lats, which is the widest muscle of the back, is considered a back muscle, but it's a powerful shoulder extensor. So you could be like hanging in like a pull-up position, pull yourself this way so that the shoulders are extending backward. That is a powerful action of the latissimus dorsi. It's a shoulder extensor. It can also adduct the shoulder, bring it closer to midline. But the reason why I bring up the latissimus dorsi is that its origin is on a little bit of the sacrum, all of the lumbar vertebrae, and the lower six thoracic vertebrae. So that thoracic and lumbar broad tendon is called the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. So it's another broad, flat tendon. Fascia, fascia is a term that describes this fibrous connective tissue that really surrounds everything. Um, I'm, I don't really care to differentiate between superficial fascia, deep fascia. Fascia is just this fibrous connective tissue that covers everything in your body. It covers muscles. It covers blood vessels, organs. Everything you can think of in the body is surrounded by fascia. 
if you've ever, if you're not a vegetarian, if you've ever eaten um, a piece of chicken, let's say a chicken wing or a chicken drumstick, if you look at it, you have the skin. If you peel off the skin, there's this very, very thin translucent layer that you can peel off that's superficial to the meat. The meat is the muscle. The muscle is attaching to the bone. So that fascia is that very, very tough, clear, translucent sheath that you can see, but it really surrounds everything. And fascia could be a major problem, especially with injuries. If anyone has ever broken a clavicle or broken an arm and has had an arm in a sling like this, let's say it's around a sling or it's in a cast and you're this way for four to five weeks. The problem with fascia is that it's adaptable to the position it's held in and it can freeze. So if my arm is kept in this position for four to five weeks in a sling, or in a, in a cast, and then I cut the cast or I take the sling off, what do you think happens to my arm? Do you think that with ease, it's gonna open up into full extension? Or do you think when it's cut off, it's gonna feel stiff and I have to slowly open that up very carefully, right? It's held and due to fascia, it's kept in this short and contracted state. And you slowly, with therapy, have to slowly open that up. Otherwise, you could do some pretty serious damage. All right, let's take a look now at the uh, neuromuscular junction. Muscles are controlled by nerves. The nerve that goes to a muscle that makes it contract is called a somatic motor neuron. Somatic motor neuron. These are the neurons that control the voluntary contraction of muscles. If we take a look up at the top, here is a neuron. Remember, if we look at, let's say the hand, the fingers would be the dendrites, then you have the palm, which is the cell body, and then you have an axon, right? So dendrite, cell body, and axon. And at the very end of the axon, again, you have the sprouting of the axon into what we call axon terminals, which is what we're seeing here. These are axon terminals. So this axon at the end of the axon terminal are these synaptic end bulbs, which is a vessel that contains neurotransmitters. So this neurotransmitter, you can see here's just the end of an axon. It's contacting the muscle. This would be the muscle. And there is a space, there's a gap between the nerve and the muscle. That's called the neuromuscular junction. This gap or this space is called a cleft. It's called a synaptic cleft. It's just a gap or a space between the neuron and the muscle. At the very end of this axon in the axon terminal are a bunch of vessels. That's these red things here. And these vessels contain neurotransmitters. And the most important neurotransmitter that we talk about in terms of muscle excitation and muscle contraction is acetylcholine. A-C-H. A-C-H is acetylcholine. It is the excitatory neurotransmitter. It is always excitatory at the neuromuscular junction. So acetylcholine is released. And the only way that that acetylcholine is released is because a mineral came in here by the name of calcium, and it instructed this neurotransmitter to release itself through exocytosis, meaning it moved to the end, it opened up, released its contents in the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine is the key. It's gonna bind to a channel. The channel or the doorway that it's going to bind to is a sodium channel. 
and the sodium channel can open or close. The key that opens it is this neurotransmitter called ACH, acetylcholine. When acetylcholine binds to this sodium channel, the sodium channel opens and sodium influxes in. When sodium rushes in, it creates what we see here called excitation. This excitation is going to travel down this tubule. This tubule right here is called a transverse tubule or a T tubule. The T in T tubule stands for transverse. Why? Because this tubule runs transversely to everything else that's going horizontally here. So it's a transverse tubule. This transverse tubule is going to butt up against this structure right here that is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the SR for short, sarcoplasmic reticulum. What is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum? This mineral called calcium. So when the excitation, this depolarization, this excitable nerve impulse travels down from the nerve, into the muscle, down this transverse tubule, and that excitation hits the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is gonna release calcium. Now calcium is gonna do something pretty magical right here. This structure, which is a combination of thick and thin filaments is called a sarcomere. The sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle. It is the contractile unit of muscle. It's microscopic, you can't see it, but it is the appearance, this thin and thick filament when light um, goes through the thin and thick filaments under a microscope, it gives it a striated appearance. That's why it's skeletal muscle is considered striated. The thin filaments are called actin, and the thick filaments are called myosin. And these small little extensions coming off of myosin are called myosin heads. These myosin heads must find a way to connect to actin. These myosin heads have to find a way to attach and articulate with actin. And we're gonna go through this a few times so that you understand it. But when the contact is made, it can create a contraction, okay? So let's take a look at this one more time in another illustration. Here is the neuron. This happens to be an axon. The axon comes to this end right here. And at the end, we call it the neuromuscular junction because it's where the nerve and the muscle come together. But the very end of that axon is called the axon terminal. So let's take a look at this box, at this square right here. So the yellow is this yellow. The pink is this pink. Now at the very end of the nerve, what is it that we see? At the end of that axon, we see a bunch of these synaptic vessels that contain a neurotransmitter. What is the neurotransmitter that's stored at the very end of the axon at the neuromuscular junction? Well, the name of that neurotransmitter is called ACH or acetylcholine. It is always excitatory at the neuromuscular junction. We see lots of mitochondria as well. Now let's take a look at this square right here. Again, we're gonna blow up the neuromuscular junction one more time, and we're looking at the bottom picture. So here is a full vessel. We see there's acetylcholine there. We see that this vessel moved to the end of the axon terminal where it opened up. And it's going to release that excitatory neurotransmitter acetylcholine in this gap between the axon and the membrane of the muscle called the synaptic cleft. 
we can see that the acetylcholine is binding to this door, to these channels. That's called a sodium channel. When acetylcholine binds to that channel and it opens up, sodium rushes in. And you can see here is a transverse tubule and it's going to create an action potential or an excitatory neurological impulse. Again, the same thing. Here is a neuron, here are the dendrites, here's the cell body, here's the axon, here's the end of the axon, this is the axon terminal. This box is the neuromuscular junction. If we take this, here is the axon terminal. These are the neurotransmitters, acetylcholine. This space or this cleft is the synaptic cleft, and this is the muscle. So if we look off to the right, here's the axon, here's the axon terminal with the acetylcholine. It's releasing the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds to the sodium channel. Sodium channel opens. All of the sodium rushes in. When it rushes in, it creates excitation down the transverse tubule or T tubule. It butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is this. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which stores what? It stores calcium. It then releases that calcium. <clears throat> it releases the calcium and affects the sarcomere. What is the sarcomere? It's the functional unit of muscle where the contractile proteins exist. What are the contractile proteins? Well, the thin filament is actin and the thick filament is myosin. And there are some interaction that takes place that makes the muscle contract. And that's what we're gonna go over now. So take a close look here at the muscle. Here is the T-tubule. See how this is the transverse tubule. And then what's running this way in the blue, the blue mesh-like structure is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And there is connection or contact between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the T-tubule. And we call this a triad. The triad is this. Here's the T-tubule. That's one structure right here. Two, three. You have these two dilated parts of the sarcoplasmic reticulum butting up against the transverse tubule. So you have one T-tubule, and two dilated parts of the sarcoplasmic reticulum butting up against it. What is stored in here? What's stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum? What mineral is stored in here? Calcium. And if you look deep, if you look deep to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you could see the actin and myosin. You could see those myofibrils underneath. That's what's going to interact. To contract. So the sarcomere is composed of three different things. Number two, the contractile proteins that I mentioned before, actin and myosin. In an earlier lecture, I mentioned these two regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin. They're called regulatory because they're going to regulate the contraction. It's basically considered to be the on or off switch. And then we have structural proteins, titan, dystrophin, nebulin. They deal with alignment of muscle and the stabilization and the elasticity or extensibility of the muscles themselves. There are some autoimmune conditions that exist against these structural proteins. We're familiar with muscular dystrophy. That's dystrophin. Muscular dystrophy is when there's attack of the body's own structural proteins. We're gonna take a look at numbers one and two and how they react together to make muscles contract. So again, the contractile proteins are myosin and actin. 
we have regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin. And then we have these structural proteins. We're gonna take a look at how these interact together, okay? <clears throat> So when we talk about actin, which is the thin filament, we're going to see troponin, tropomyosin. We're gonna see actin F and actin G. If we look back here, each of these small circles is a G molecule, but all these Gs line up to make a chain called an F strand. So each individual pearl or circle is a G molecule, but all these G molecules lined up to create an F strand. You will also see that along each F strand, you can see tropomyosin and troponin. It's a little bit small in this picture, so I'm gonna find another one that's gonna be a little bit larger, like this one here. So each purple circle is a G molecule, but all of these Gs combined is an F strand. Now I want you to pay attention to the center of each G molecule. You see how there's like a bright round purple circle, like a target sign, like a target on each of these. You can see the circle, the purple one, but you can't see the full thing. Why? Because there's this protein that's covering it, this orange string. This orange rope or this orange string is called tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is covering that target. The name of that target is called a binding site. It's a binding site. Keep that in mind. Sometimes it's called an active site. Sometimes it's called a binding site. They're interchangeable terms. Active site or binding site. Where is the active site? Where is the binding site? it's located on actin on each G molecule. Is it fully exposed in this picture? No, it's not fully exposed. Well, why is it? What's blocking it? What's blocking it is this regulatory protein called tropomyosin. Now, is there another regulatory protein that's holding it in its place? Why, well, yes, there is this regulatory protein right here called troponin. Think of troponin as a staple and it is holding tropomyosin in place. As long as these staples are here, as long as troponin is there, it's holding tropomyosin in place and it's actually blocking the binding sites. If these binding sites were not blocked, if they were open and exposed, the binding site or the active site is the actual location where myosin heads can bind to, to create the contraction. But in this case, they're blocked, they're not exposed. Here is a picture of myosin. Myosin has a head and it has tails. And I want you to think about, again, if we use my arm as an analogy, the tail can bend in two places. This can bend here at the elbow joint, which can move up, and then it can bend here at the wrist. So the fingers, my finger of my, my hand would be the head of the myosin. So it can bend this way, and then it can bend this way. If this hand represents actin and this is myosin, I have to bend up and attach right there to the binding site. But this attachment to the binding site can only happen if the binding site is exposed. If troponin and tropomyosin are in its place, then this stays in this position. If troponin and tropomyosin are removed, it's almost magnetic where this comes up and grabs on. And then it can flick, right? The wrist can bend, taking actin and contracting it, moving it like this. Okay, just keep that in mind. 
So here again on the top is just another picture of actin. We can see in this case, they're orange. You could see it's an active site that's yellow. And we could see that they're blocked. The active site or the binding site on actin is being blocked by the tropomyosin. And the tropomyosin is being held in place by troponin. We need something to come in. We need a staple remover to move, remove the staple troponin so that tropomyosin can shift. And when it shifts or relocates, the binding sites are exposed and they're open. If you look down at the bottom, this is a classical picture of the myosin tail in the head. Remember how I used my hand as the analogy of myosin, where it can bend here and then bend here? Well, right here, we could see the two hinges. There's one hinge here and the second hinge here. This is the myosin head and that can move based on that second hinge like this, okay? If we look at the top picture and look at the bottom, we see this H zone here compared to this H zone here. The top one is the sarcomere at rest. The bottom one, this happened. A shortening phase of the contraction took place, okay? Well, how did that take place? Here's how it took place. Let's look at the left. On the left side, steps one through five are the steps that initiate a contraction. On the right, steps six through 10 are the steps that end the contraction. Important to know, you know you're gonna see it on the test, you know you're gonna probably have to put these in some sort of order. So make sure you know what's happening here in basic terms. So here is the neuromuscular junction. Here is the synaptic terminal. Here's the axon and here's the end of the axon. What do we have at the end of the axon? These are uh, vessels that contain a neurotransmitter. What's the name of the neurotransmitter that's always found at the neuromuscular junction that is always excitatory? ACH, acetylcholine. So that's released via exocytosis, right? It opens up, releases its contents. Where is it released? In the synaptic cleft. What's the synaptic cleft? The space between the axon and the muscle. On the belly of the muscle, or on this membrane of the muscle, I should say, there are these channels, sodium channels. When the acetylcholine binds to this receptor, the receptor opens, or the channel opens, and sodium rushes in. When sodium rushes in, it goes down the T-tubule, we get this excitation, an action potential for excitability that goes down the transverse tubule. As it goes down, it butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum that releases calcium. It's the calcium that does the magic. The calcium goes in, it pulls out troponin. When it pulls out troponin, tropomyosin moves out of the way so that the binding sites are now open. In which case, here's the myosin. You can see that it bends upward and makes contact with actin. And when it does, the contraction can take place. Well, how do we end the contraction? Well, if acetylcholine was the thing that initiated this whole sequence of events, we have to remove acetylcholine and it does so by degrading it. There's an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. So we have acetylcholine esterase that is going to break down the acetylcholine. Now, if there's no acetylcholine, then you have nothing to hit the channel or the receptor to keep it open, so it shuts which means there's no more excitation going down the T-tubule, which means there's nothing hitting the sarcoplasmic reticulum, giving it the message to release calcium. And in fact, the calcium goes back into storage and it's stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If there's no more calcium that's hitting the sarcomere, then the troponin and the tropomyosin go back in their place, covering the binding sites, AKA, the active site. If that happens, then there's no more contraction. 
the contraction ends. So here is more of a step-by-step play-by-action. This goes along with this. So one through five is one through five, and then six through 10 is six through 10. So at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine is released by the synaptic terminal. The resulting change in the transmembrane potential of the muscle fiber leads to a production of an action potential spreading across the entire surface of the muscle along the T-tubule. Remember the T-tubule butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which stores calcium. Now that calcium is gonna be released when it's released, the calcium is gonna to bind to troponin. Remember, that's the staple. So it's gonna to bind to troponin, remove it. That's the staple remover. Calcium is the staple remover, creating this train change to the troponin-tropomyosin complex. So now tropomyosin shifts and the binding sites are now exposed. And now the myosin heads can bind to actin, creating a contraction. Now, the only way that the myosin head detaches itself is through ATP. You need energy in order for the myosin heads to detach, right? If I'm holding on to a rope, if we, if we have a tug of war and I say, ready, set, go, and I pull the rope towards me, I still need to pull, right? I still need to contract. So what do I have to do? I have to release and grab another binding site and pull, and then release and then pull. It's the releasing of the myosin head that requires ATP. Not the actual pulling part, it's the actual releasing part. It takes energy to release. We know this, right? We know this to be true because if you see someone, if you ever watch any of these like uh, CSI Miami, crime scene investigator Miami or CSI New York, any of these type of shows where uh, an investigation team goes to a crime scene and they see a body on the floor, they're usually in a state of rigor mortis. The body is in a shortened, contracted state. Why? Well, because they're dead. And if you're dead, you're not producing energy. If there's no ATP, you can't release this to a nice relaxed position. So it's in a shortened, contracted state. So you need ATP in order to release the myosin heads. Okay, let's just see. Uh, this is pretty repetitious here. There's nothing new here. Let's just see if there's anything else that I need to go over with you in person. So here, this is just a good visual. If you go clockwise, again, you could see the interaction between here is actin, here is myosin. Now, I want you to kind of look at what we see at the myosin heads. You see how we have ADP and another P hanging out here? You see the same thing here? The ADP is what? It's adenosine diphosphate. The other P is another phosphate. When you have lots of ATP, your body doesn't wanna keep ATP all stored around like that. So if you have ATP, which is three phosphates, it'll separate one so that you have ADP. And then this phosphate hangs out and attaches to creatine. So it's called creatine phosphate. It's just the additional phosphate that's there close by to attach to this one when you need ATP quickly, all right? So you could see we have stored energy waiting to go. You have a adenosine diphosphate with creatine phosphate here. Then all of a sudden, we start to see something happen to creatine phosphate. Uh-huh. Look at the difference between this picture here and this picture here. What was needed, notice here it's attached, the myosin head is attached to the binding site, but notice here it's detached. This happened. 
detach only to retach again. So the detachment is what requires adenosine triphosphate. Uh, make sure you click on that link just so you can actually go through a little bit more of a visual of what I was explaining to you. Uh, all of this, again, read this. This is just for you if you are more linear and you want to read the step-by-step, -step, but I have thoroughly explained this to you. Whenever you see NT, it means neurotransmitter. Again, just another picture showing the same thing. Here's the neuromuscular junction. Here's the axon. It's binding to the muscle. Here is calcium influxing in, telling these neurotransmitters to release themselves in the synaptic cleft. So what's releasing itself is the acetylcholine. So it's gonna bind to the sodium channel, sodium rushes in, right? We could see that here on the bottom. Here's exocytosis of the acetylcholine. It's binding to the sodium channel, Sodium rushes in, it rushes down into the transverse tubule. Again, the same steps. I just tried to find several images that are a little bit different, but yet contain the exact same steps over and over so that you can self-test yourself on this concept. Make sure you watch the neuromuscular junction link. Um, in terms of muscle metabolism, just a little bit that I wanted you to know here, and it's pretty much what I discussed already in the past, plus you heard me mention creatine phosphate. So here you have creatine up on the top in the center, and you can see that creatine hooks up with ATP, robs one of these phosphates, so that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, becomes adenosine diphosphate. So what happened to this other phosphate? It hooked up to creatine, creating creatine phosphate. This is just energy waiting to be used. So when ADP needs to be converted back to energy, to ATP, it robs that phosphate away from creatine and gives us ATP again, okay? If we go back to cellular respiration, we breathe in oxygen, the oxygen that we need, is needed for the Krebs cycle to produce ATP. But if before the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain that both take place in the mitochondria take place, we have to first take glucose and break it down. So we're taking the six carbon sugar, breaking it down into these two, three carbon sugars. That's called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. The breakdown of glucose into pyruvic acid takes place in the cytosol in the cell, but in the cytosol. That's called glycolysis. Once you have pyruvic acid in the presence of oxygen, it can then ent enter into the mitochondria for the first step of the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle produces some energy as does glycolysis, but not very much. These two are minor players in energy production but this creates many coenzymes that are needed for the electron transport chain to produce ATP. It's called oxidative phosphorylation, okay? In the Krebs cycle, I'm sorry, in the electron transport chain, that's where CoQ10 is needed, that coenzyme Q10 to produce ATP or energy. It also needs iron. That's why people who are iron deficient or iron deficiency anemia get fatigue because they're not capable of producing a lot of energy. People who are B vitamin deficient, especially B1, B2, and B3, then the Krebs cycle doesn't work efficiently, okay? The Cori cycle is an interesting cycle. When we look at the removal and the recycling of lactic acid by the liver, the liver has to convert lactic acid or lactate into pyruvate. Okay, so if we go back here, here's pyruvate. 
glucose gets converted to pyruvic acid when oxygen is available. If oxygen isn't available, then the other sugar is called lactic acid or lactate. This is when you're exercising and training and you have no more oxygen available. You're pushing weights really hard. You have no more energy, you have no more oxygen, then your muscles burn. That burning sensation is the accumulation of that lactic acid. And that burning sensation only goes away when lactic acid is converted back to pyruvic acid in the presence of oxygen. That's why you keep on exhaling, even when you're stopped training, you go, <sighs> and then eventually the fast rapid breathing slows down only when you're not in an oxygen debt anymore. Okay. So the Cori cycle is this ability to convert lactic acid to pyruvic acid or pyruvic acid to lactic acid. It's this two-way shuttle. And it takes place in the liver. The liver is a big conversion center for the Cori cycle. Glucose is released to recharge muscle glycogen reserves. Remember, glycogen is the storage form of glucose. Glucose is stored in the liver and it's stored in muscle. Hormones that can affect muscle metabolism, uh, growth hormone, this is why sleep is so very important. After about 50 minutes of sleep, your body pushes out this burst of growth hormone. This is why professional athletes take that nap in the afternoon. This is why babies sleep so much. They're growing, they need growth hormone. Plus babies, they're like energizer batteries, right? They have so much energy and then it burns out quickly and then they just conk out, all right? So growth hormone uh, is produced about 50 minutes after sleep and you can downregulate the effects of growth hormone if you have a sweet tooth before you go to bed. So if you go, oh, I wanna have a cookie before I go to sleep. Oh, I just want a bowl of ice cream. Oh, I just want a little cereal and you have this refined carbohydrate just before bedtime, you block the receptors of growth hormone. So you wake up and you wake up just as tired as you did when you went to bed. If that sounds like you, make sure you're not consuming a refined carbohydrate or anything with sugar in it just before bedtime. Testosterone also has a major influence on muscle metabolism. It makes them thicker. Your thyroid hormones have a major influence influence over metabolism, generally speaking. And so does epinephrine, right? You have epinephrine and norepinephrine. These affect the sympathetic neural system. Muscle fatigue is the ability to maintain the force of contraction for a long period of time because you're exhausted, you're tired. Well, when can this happen? Well, maybe you don't have enough calcium, right? Inadequate release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you're not going to have strong enough contractions. Maybe you don't have enough creatine phosphate. Um, I used to play around with creatine um, when I was doing heavy power lifting for many years, and it works. I could tell you that um, I would use an alkaline version of creatine called crealkaline. It's a lot easier on the kidneys. Um, it doesn't create an acidic type of exhaust for your body to try and push out or the kidneys. And it gives you this immediate um, energy for quick movements, not for anything long distance, but if you want a quick deadlift, if you want a fast lift, something that gives you that strong uh, burst of energy in the beginning, that's what creatine is for, creatine phosphate. So if you're depleted of CP, oxygen or nutrients, generally speaking, that can result in fatigue, such as iron. If you don't have iron, oxygen can't bind to iron. That results in fatigue. If you don't have proper B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, you can't make ATP. If you don't have magnesium, you can't produce energy. Okay. Um, you can have the buildup of lactic acid and adenosine diphosphate that can result in fatigue and an insufficient release of that neurotransmitter acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. 
So when you're exercising and you're breathing heavily for an extended period of time, you're trying to pay back yourself of that oxygen debt that you put yourself in. The extra oxygen goes towards replenishing the creatine phosphate stores, restoring your oxygen level converts that lactic acid back into pyruvate so that pyruvate can enter the mitochondria for the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, and it reloads oxygen onto myoglobin. We'll talk about myoglobin in just a few minutes. It'll actually come up in conversation during Thanksgiving time. Um, if you happen to eat turkey or celebrate uh, with turkey for Thanksgiving, there's always this big, I don't wanna say argument or debate, but people have a preference, let's say that. I prefer the white meat, someone else prefers the dark meat. What makes certain meat of the bird white versus dark? It has something to do with myoglobin. So we'll talk about that shortly. So we, we showed this before in that other slide. Um, at rest, muscle produces more ATP than is needed. So ATP can transfer its phosphate to creatine, right? So ATP plus creatine gives us ADP because that creatine is going to rob that phosphate. When you need energy, the ADP joins up with creatine phosphate again to give you ATP. During each contraction, the myosin head breaks down ATP, producing ADP and the phosphate. ADP plus creatine phosphate, in the presence of this enzyme, creatine phosphokinase, CPK, gives us back to ATP. CPK, this creatine phosphokinase, stores itself in muscle cells. When muscle cells become damaged, the membrane opens up and can release CPK into the blood. So after really strenuous exercises, muscle fibers do break down. And when muscle breaks down, you go through inflammation, muscles hypertrophy, they thicken and build up and get stronger. But when it's CPK levels that get high, not from an intense workout based on history, but maybe a heart attack, right? If the heart cells and the muscle cells of the heart are dying and those cardiomyocytes open up, it too can increase CPK levels. So health history is important. If you go to the doctor and they go, oh my gosh, your CPK levels are high and you go, oh, you know, I just came from a crazy CrossFit session. That's why my CPK levels are high. Or they say, did you do any exercise today? No, I didn't exercise today. I don't exercise at all. Okay. You're having shortness of breath. Yes. You're having chest pain. Yes. You're getting shooting pain down the left arm and into the jaw. Yes, yes, yes. Most likely a heart attack. So, this is an interesting illustration. It's important to lay down some framework because soon enough we'll be getting into neurology. This is a cross section of a spinal cord and the spinal cord has a spinal nerve and the nerve has a sensory part to it, which is back here. And then it has a motor part, which is in the front called somatic motor neurons. So you can see that somatic motor neurons can branch out and really branch out to small parts of a muscle or the entire unit, okay? So this is sensory input, comes in from the back. This is dorsal or posterior. And from the anterior or ventral side, we have motor neurons coming out to muscle. This muscle fiber, all of these fibers will also send feedback in this way, sensory information. And it gives sensory information about the tone of the muscle, how much tension is being generated. So here's a little uh, short clip you can watch on control of muscle tension and muscle tone. We already spoke about concentric and eccentric and isometric. I don't have to go through that. The example I gave earlier was lifting something, let's say here a book 
We're going from here to here. The biceps are contracting and it's shortening. That's concentric. Eccentric is when the biceps elongate, when the origin and the insertion move further away. When there's no movement and you're holding this against the force of gravity, that's considered an isometric contraction. In terms of muscle fibers, I mentioned before about white meat versus dark meat. This is the big preference. Uh, dark meat in chickens are found in the thigh and the white meat is found in the breast. Now, technically birds, when they're flying, the dark meat should be found in the wings, in the breast, in the pectoralis. Why? Because if these are moving all the time, it needs more blood, it needs more myoglobin, needs more oxygen, needs more iron. And the legs, which aren't working too much, should be white meat, right? But when you cut the flight feathers, the opposite takes place, right? You start to see dark meat in the breast and the legs appear, uh, let, let me get that right. Technically, when birds are flying, this should be the dark meat, right? Because there's more blood and more cholesterol and more myoglobin. But when you cut the flight feathers, this becomes white meat. The breast becomes white meat and the legs and the drumsticks, that becomes the dark meat because they're using the legs a whole lot more and the thighs, okay? Excuse me, Doc. Yes. Someone's in the waiting room. I don't think we have a waiting room. Uh, they just said, they were like, oh, my computer died. I'm going to be in the waiting room. Can someone tell him? Yeah, let them know to check their email. Because remember this link, there is no waiting room. Thank you. We'll have a recording to send them anyway. Okay. Um, white fibers, they're white because there's little blood. There's less myoglobin. There's less mitochondria. So white fibers are fast, they're used for power and speed, right? If you're doing a deadlift, that's power and speed. If you're doing a long distance run, if you're running a marathon, you need more red fibers in your quads and your legs. You need slow twitch fibers. These have more myoglobin, much more mitochondria, these are used for activities that require long endurance. Posturally speaking, the muscles of your back have lots of red twitch fibers because they're always contracting to keep your body in an erect position. Okay. If you could just mute yourself. All right, so the fast twitch fibers uh, contract quickly. They have uh, large glycogen reserves, very few mitochondria. It's for a strong contraction, but what's the problem with them? They fatigue easily. Whereas the slow twitch fibers, they act slow. They take a long time for them to fatigue because they have much more mitochondria. More mitochondria, more myoglobin, more oxygen. You're not going to fatigue very easily in those areas. Okay. Muscle hypertrophy versus atrophy. I think I mentioned this before. When you're training and you're training heavy, muscles will hypertrophy. They will get thicker. They'll increase in diameter. When you're exercising, muscles go through what's called mitochondrial biogenesis. It means you increase more mitochondria. And the more mitochondria, the more energy. So the more you exercise, the more energy you actually get. When you don't use your muscles, muscles will atrophy. Muscles atrophy from the lack of activity. If someone's arm is in a cast and they're not moving it, this muscle girth and thickness on one extremity will start to atrophy in relationship to the other. And not just, this is amazing stuff, not just the muscle atrophies, the brain on the opposite side atrophies, okay? So 
the left side of the brain controls motor movement on the right side of the body. If my right side isn't moving and there's no sensory input getting into the left side of the brain, it starts to atrophy. So they've also discovered that if you closed your eyes and visualized that arm moving, even though it couldn't, it would increase the activity in the other side of the brain and it doesn't atrophy. Pretty wild stuff. They've done this exercise with Olympic athletes as well, where they put little electrodes on all major muscles of the body. And they told them to close their eyes and to visualize themselves running and jumping over hurdles. And as they were running and jumping over the hurdles, the muscles contracted to the parts of the brain in the same exact order sequence as if they were physically doing it. That's the amazing part of that. Okay, let's see, we covered cardiac muscle is striated. Uh, cardiac muscle has these structures here called intercalated discs. It's just where one cardiomyocyte and the other come together. It creates a cardiac uh, intercalated disc. You can see it's also striated. Not going to get much into cardiac muscle. We will do that in anatomy two. Smooth muscle, we will get into quite a bit in anatomy two. I would just know that it's around organs and blood vessels and it's uh, not voluntary, but involuntary. Hypertrophy, we spoke about. Atrophy, we spoke about. Uh, the term hyperplasia means an increase in the number of cells. An increase in the number, not so much increase in size. Okay, nothing really big there. Um, myotomes and dermatomes. Okay, dermatomes is a mapping of the skin. I believe we spoke about this when we did um, the integumentary system. So dermatomes is a neurological mapping of the skin where if I had a problem in my neck, I was in an accident, a whiplash accident, and I have nerves on the right side of my neck pinching, affecting my right upper extremity. If I have numbness and tingling here to my lateral side of my forearm, to these two fingers, that's considered the C6 dermatome. If I have numbness and tingling to the middle digit, that is the C7 dermatome. C5 is up here. So I have C5, numbness and tingling here. C6, numbness and tingling here. C7, the birdie, numbness and tingling here. C8, numbness and tingling here. C5 dermatome is up here. C6 is here. C7 is here. C8 is the last two fingers to about mid forearm. And then T1, if I just lay my hand right there, that's T1 dermatome. And then T2 is PU under the armpit. Once again, C5, C6, C7, C8, the last two fingers to mid forearm. Then if I just lay my hand down, that's T1 and then T2 is PU. That is called dermatomes. It's a neurological mapping of the skin coming from the neck, but it also can happen in the lower back as well. Some people that have back trauma, if they fall and they herniate a disc or subluxate something in their lumbar spine, if the great toe goes numb on the top, that could be on the side, maybe an L4 dermatome. If all the toes go numb on top, that's L5. If the bottom of the foot goes numb, that's the S1 dermatome, for the first sacral segment. So that's dermatome. It's a neurological mapping of the skin. Myotomes, 
myotomes are nerves that control the same group of muscles. So the myotome for the deltoids, bringing my arm this way in abduction, that is my C5 dermatome. C6 dermat, um, not dermatome, myotome, my bad. Deltoid is the C5 myotome. C6, elbow flexion, myotome. C6 is also wrist extension. C7 looks like this, like I'm making the number seven. C7 myotome is elbow extension, wrist flexion, and finger extension. See, there's the number seven. So it's finger extension, wrist flexion, and elbow extension. That C7 controls all of those muscle, myo, muscle actions. C8 controls finger flexion. And then T1 controls abduction and adduction of the fingers. Those are called myotomes. Myo is muscle. So the nerves that come out of the neck control muscles, myotome, and the nerves that come out of the neck create, controls dermatome, which is the sensory. Don't worry about sclerotomes for now. Um, as people get a little bit older, muscle strength and flexibility naturally tend to decrease. Reflexes tend to slow down a little bit. We see this when, as people get older, right? We see a lot of inpatient drivers. They'll drive and they'll go, ah, oh, I got this old lady in front of me. Ah, oh, I got this old man in front of me. Oh my God, they drive so slow. They should retest them, get them off the road. Right? We hear a lot of these people say things like this, but their reflexes are slower. They were meaning their response time is slower. So it's only natural for them to drive slower. Can it potentially be dangerous? Absolutely, right? When the rest of the world is driving 40, 45 miles an hour on a May road and someone's going a little bit slower, it does disrupt the flow and it can create accidents. But this just explains the understanding of why their reflexes are just slower, which means their response time is slower. Uh, so those are the main things. You'll also notice that if you look at the elderly and you look at the back of their hands, the back of their hands should be muscular. When the palms, when they open up their fingers and you look down in between each of the knuckles, you'll see hills and valley, hills and valley. You shouldn't, but in the elderly in which muscles are wasting away, you'll see these depressions in between each of the knuckles or each of the metacarpals. That's called sarcopenia. When their body is breaking down their own muscles, it's breaking down their own muscles because they're not eating enough protein. If you're not eating enough protein, your body will self-digest its own protein for fuel. And that's what happens when people are also chronically sick. They'll look at the person, they'll see that they look emaciated, they could see the cheekbones and they'll say they don't have much longer, right? Because they're using, they're not eating, there's no carbohydrates, there's no fats in their diet and they're digesting their own body proteins for fuel, okay? All right, that is it. Let me stop the screen share and the recording.